started. Thank you guys so much for being here today. It is the April edition of Lunch a la Carte, sponsored by the Cart Fund, and our immediate past president, Bill Parker, is going to introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much, and I might point out that uh, Dr. Wernig was one of our first COVID uh, award recipients. Uh, you were scheduled to come and meet all of us uh, in Columbia in 2020, and unfortunately, Didn't COVID happen. had a different idea. So we got your presentation from your, your room at your home. That's right. <laughs> anyway, in 2020, Dr. Wernig received uh, a $250,000 CART grant, and he was looking at using uh, uh, stem cells uh, to modify micro microglia uh, in a mouse model uh, to reverse the impact of uh, inflammation, which uh, results, we think, in Alzheimer's. Um, Dr. Wernig is a professor in the Department of Pathology <clears throat> and Chemical and Systems Biology and the co-director of the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine at Stanford University. He graduated with an MD, PhD from the Technical University of Munich in Germany, where he trained in developmental ge genetics in the lab of Rudy Balling. After completing his residency in neuropathology and general pathology at the University of Bonn, he then became a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Rudolf Jensik at the Whitehead Institute of Biomedical Research at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He has received an NIH Pathway to Independence Award, and he's received the Cazzarelli Prize for Outstanding Scientific Excellence from the National Academy of Sciences in the USA, and Outstanding Investigator Award from the International Society of Stem Cell Research, the New York Stem Cell Foundation Robertson Stem Cell Prize, and more recently was awarded the Ogawa Yamanaki Stem Cell Prize presented by the Gladstone Institute and has been named an HHMI faculty scholar. Dr. Wernick's lab is interested in pluripoint stem cell biology, the molecular determinants of neural cell fate decisions. His laboratory was the first to generate functional neuronal cells reprogrammed directly from skin fibroblasts, which he termed induced neuronal or IN cells. The lab is now working on identifying the molecular mechanisms underlying induced lineage face, fate changes, the phenotypic consequences of disease-causing mutations in human neurons and other neural lineages, as well as the development of novel therapeutic targeting and cell transplantation based strategies for a variety of monogenetic diseases. What this means in essence is instead of focusing on the uh, amyloid beta plaques floating around the brain, he's now looking at the tau tangles, which are the critical element that kills neuron cells. And with that, Dr. Wernig, thank you very much for what you do for CART and you have the floor, sir. Well, I would like, okay, I, first of all, I would like to thank you so much for this very kind introduction. Um, and uh, it, it sounded like um, you're introducing somebody really important, uh, but I, everything you say is true. So um, I guess uh, I have had some accomplishments in my life already, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> um, so um, let me share my screen. And perfect. Uh huh. I need to get to my presentation. And uh huh. Very good. And now I want to move the 
the video on my other screen. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah. Um, um, as uh, was just said, um, my lab is uh, very interested in, uh, in particular in, in potential cell therapies for the brain. And uh, in particular, we, we think neurodegeneration such as Alzheimer's disease might be actually a very relevant and, and uh, very good disease target for, for this approach. So thank you so much for this for this funding we received in 2020, because that was really the, the, the first seed really funding that we obtained to um to move the uh, you know this this idea into where we are now which which uh, as, as you will see uh it's uh, we are far into this direction already so we're very very excited about it uh -huh. so i'm not just I need to make sure my slides are moving they are perfect so just uh, as, as a very brief introduction i'm sure you're all uh, aware of this um, what's the problem really in Alzheimer's disease? So I, I've shown you here a little, a little drawing from a review here. So this is like one half of the brain as it uh, usually uh, looks like. Um, and what you what you see in Alzheimer's brains, which, which is, by the way, what, what uh, Mr. Alzheimer himself described, you know, I don't know when, like 1902 or something like this, uh, many years ago, uh, he essentially described two main things. And those were these A-beta plaques, that were just mentioned, but also what, what we believe are probably the more toxic species, these, these tangles, these neurofibrillary tangles. So if these, these two flavors, and to this day, people are debating like what is more important, what, what, what should we really tar try to target? Uh, so it's, it's, re it's really unclear and there's a lot, a lot of debate ab about this. Uh, this is just uh, showing you how this looks like, not, not in a schematic drawing, but actually in, in, in the real brain, when, when you slice it and look, look under these, uh, these sections in the, in the microscope. So here you, you see these, these plaques, these deposits, which are sort of scattered around the brain, uh, uh, sort of randomly, it seems, um, that can be stained with specific reagents. Um, and and these are these these malform or these these abnormality, uh, abnormalities that we call uh, tangles that stand for these tau antibodies. So it turns out these tangles that um, Lois uh, Alzheimer described, you know, over hundred years ago, uh, are mostly consistent of, of fibrillary um, tau molecules. And that all somehow, um, and I think the one thing where where people are not so much um, uh, debating about is that there's a, a third component that Lois Alzheimer did not know about, which is neuroinflammation. And, and these, these microglial cells, which are the main immune cells of the brain, clearly play an important role in sort of mediating this process that eventually leads to essentially the degeneration of, of neurons. And, and that's why the, the brain shrinks, that the sheer volume gets, gets smaller. You'll see also these, these liquid filled spaces in, in the middle here, we call them ventricles, they get larger as the tissue shrinks, right? So from the outside and from the inside, the brain just shrinks and then the neurons just disappear. Um, and yeah, this is just uh, um, you know, from, from, from the same review. Uh, the, the field has come a long way to, to really get also at markers, right? So, so what, 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 what at least can, can we measure things other than you know, the people lose memory, which is really hard to, to measure, right? How well do you remember um, uh, that you lost your keys, right, of, of your car. And it's really hard to measure, but, but measuring actually these, these uh, plaque materials in the, in the uh, brain liquid um, and tau itself, as well as some other parameters really have been uh, important to, to already have markers of the disease way earlier than the disease actually happens. So before you even notice anything uh, in an individual, we, uh, we can already measure things in the blood or in the in the in the csf as we call it the cerebrospinal fluid that you get with a with a, a lumbar puncture right um you can already see uh, these these changes and and sort of predict you know in the next five to ten years this person will probably develop alzheimer's so that's really great news because this is the point where we still can probably interfere at this stage right there, it's probably hopeless. Right? It will be very hard to try to regrow, you know, this, I don't know, half an inch of brain matter here, right? 
But if you are still in the early phase, we, we, we think we can still try to interfere with whatever is going wrong once we know what that really is, right? And then prevent this from happening. That's, I think, um, a more realistic uh, um, approach. So the brain has a lot of different cell types. It's a, not only the neurons themselves are highly complicated as they form these amazing neural circuits that you know make us what, what we are as human beings, as we think, as we have these uh, amazing you know, uh, um, um, capacities to, to use this enormous computer you know, between our ears. Um, but there's also many other cell types other than neurons. And uh, as I already mentioned, microglia are actually considered the immune, the, the main component of the immune cells of the brain. Um, and it's not exactly clear what they really do. It turns out when you uh, get rid of them, not so much is happening on the short term, but clearly on the long, long term, these cells are very important to keep essentially the structure together. If you if you have no microglia for like, um, it, you know, in a mouse's life over years, then um, the, 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 the brain sort of starts to, to, to fall apart. But on the short term, not much seems to happening. So it seems that these microglia do something very subtle to, to keep everybody happy, to uh, fend off, you know, pathogens, you know, things that go wrong. Um, and so it's, it's a very, very interesting cell type. And it's very clear that they, they are, are important in Alzheimer's. And why, do we, why are we so sure that these microglia play such a fundamental role in Alzheimer's disease? This is because of human genetics. So this slide here shows you um, most of the genes that um, people have found in large you know, genetic studies involving thousands and thousands of, of people that seem to give you a risk to develop the disease. Um, maybe some of these genes uh, you, you, you already know. The APOE is a very famous um, uh, risk factor, APOE4. In particular, if you have two copies of this four variant, you have, um, a, I think, a, like a, see a 12 fold um, risk to develop the disease. It's, this is the strongest risk factor that, that we know of. Um, but uh, more than half of all these genes, including APOE4, actually, are actually genes expressed in microglia. So this is APOE, the, you know, the most famous risk factor for the disease. And this is the, the higher the bar, the stronger um, the gene is expressed in these different cell types. And you see, so it's microglia is not the only cells. It's also astrocytes, another really interesting glial cell type that expresses APOE. But, but, but microglia contribute quite a bit to, to, the, to the pool of APOE in the brain. Um, and another very famous risk factor is TREM2. It's not quite as, um, as common, not quite as strong of a risk factor, but it's right up there, right? It's, uh, it's, it's the second strongest risk factor, really, other than APP itself, the you know, Alzheimer precursor protein itself. And that is very striking. That is truly only expressed in my career. Right? There's no detection of this gene in any other cell types. So there's no doubt that somehow this mutation in this microglial population is causing a problem, right? And, and is causing the, the disease. The big question is, what is this, uh, what are these cells doing? And more particularly, what is this TREM2 um, molecule doing, which is actually sitting on the, on the surface, on the, on the membrane of these cells. So they are, it's, it's a receptor that uh, people think is a receptor that, that senses abnormalities. If anything goes wrong, if there's like a bacteria or a virus shows up or some strange lipids show up or, or there's dying cells, then this, this receptor is believed to be activated. It's almost like a disease sensing um, molecule, people believe, right? So the idea is in some cases, we actually know what the problem is, right? The people that have a mutation in this in this receptor, we could potentially fix that problem by just replacing the microglia with microglia that have a normal version of this receptor, right? Uh, it's very hard to go into every cell and change a protein, right? But it's much easier 
conceptually to, to think to replace the microglia in its entirety and um, thereby replace them with normal cells with, with that have a normal um, TREM2 receptor. So that was the, the idea going into this, into this project. So I guess I, I've said this already, but this is just like a, a diagram to illustrate this, this idea again. So since these microglia are immune cells, they are actually related to blood cells. So that they're not really sort of really endogenous brain cells. They're not really neural cells. Developmentally speaking, they're, they come from a different source. They come from like a blood island in the embryonic yolk sac and then migrate into the brain and then live there. But um, developmentally speaking, they are really hematopoietic cells. They're, they're blood lineage cells. So um, that's why we thought it might be possible to, to take a blood blood sample from a patient, which is very easy to get, right? Uh, so easy to, to get a patient's blood, <laughs> much, much easier to get like a brain sample in comparison, right? <laughs> and then um, you isolate the blood stem cells from, from the sample and expand these, uh, these in culture, which would allow us to modify these cells. For example, fix this TREM2 mutation, right? Take, take, the, take the bad gene out and replace it with a good gene and then use these fixed cells to transplant them back into the brain, which then hopefully uh, these transplant cells would repopulate the brain and, and replace the, 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 the disease cells, right? And then prevent further damage from happening. So um, when we did this, we made one uh, important discovery. If you just do exactly, uh, try or try to do this in mice, which is our, you know, our normal working model um, and just, you know, take blood stem cells from mice, uh, label them with a, with a marker, with a green color so we can easily see them as, as a proof of concept and inject them into mouse brains, then not so much is happening. So these, these blood stem cells and or stem and progenitor cells, I should be more, uh, I should, should say, because they are not super pure stem cells, um, they, they will hang around um, in the in the site where we inject them, so I should I should say that um, this is a section through a brain where these cells were transplanted, and the, the, as I as I said, the, the transplanted cells were labeled with the green color, the green fluorescent protein or GFP. So we can detect them. We see that they are still there, which is great news. But unfortunately, they are not becoming microglia. Um, this is a marker here, Iva one. It's not so important, but that's that stains microglia. And as you can tell, the, the red and the green signal, here's an overlay, are really mutually exclusive. So these cells don't turn on this marker. They they also look very different. If you if you look a little bit more carefully, these microglia have these beautifully ramified morphologies. They have many, many little uh, cell processes. That, that, that they use to survey the tissue. But these transplanted st uh, hematopoietic stem cells, they, they are very round and, and don't, don't become these cells. So that was very disappointing in the beginning. But then we thought, well, the brain is already full of this microglia. So there, there might, might not be enough space, right? The, 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 already in, the endogenous, already existing microglia potentially send out a signal, well, you know, it's all seeds are taken, right? There's, we, we don't need anybody. Uh, so there's no need to, for, 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 these, for these stem cells to, to become microglia. So well, well, let's test this, this idea, let's test this hypothesis and um, get rid of the microglia before we transplant the cells. And that was a really game, a real game changer. This single experiment here um, taught us so much. So let me walk you through, through this data here. So. Uh, we did the same experiment as above here in this, in this lower row, um, but instead, uh, uh, using a normal mouse, we treated these mice with a, with a small molecule that kills the endogenous microglia. So essentially, we transplanted these blood stem cells into mouse brains that had no microglia in their brains for just a couple of days, right? And I hope you can appreciate how different these cells look like, right? All of a sudden, they do now start sending out little processes, right? They become a little more ramified. And when you look closely here, um, essentially all of these green cells are now not green as green here, but they're all a little yellow. 
Because when you look carefully at all these green positions here, there's a, there's a, a red marker here as well, meaning that they now turn on this microglial marker, right? So it seems that this microglia free brain has a strong influence on these transplanted cells and almost it seems like force them to all become these microglia cells. So we were really excited about this finding because we thought, well, this is a really powerful signal that we should engage, right, and, and use. Um, and, and say, and thought like, what, how about we combine this with a conventional bone marrow transplantation, which, which is done, you know, has been done a million times in, in people already. Every major hospital, you know, does a bone marrow transplantation procedure, you know, dozens of them probably every day. So it's a very well-established clinical procedure. How about we combine this with this trick to first, you know, deplete the endogenous microglia? So, so we tried this in mice. And th this is, again, again a, a nice schematic that my postdoc uh, drew. Uh, it's a very skilled artist, as you, as you can tell. So we, we, um, we have here the situation where, you know, in, in, in the red color, we have the, uh, or they symbolize this, this, this resident uh, microglia. And we inject in a bone marrow transplantation, again, these green labeled cells into the bloodstream, simply, of, of these mice, right? Um, and then use this, this uh, small molecule here, uh, you know, a, a, a pill essentially that we feed these mice uh, at the same time. And what happens is that sure enough, almost all of the endogenous uh, uh, microglia were replaced with these, with these other cells with, that we called circulation derived microglia like cells or circulation derived myelid cells, which is like a more general term because we injected them into circulation. So they obviously had to come from the circulation, right? Or, or in short, CDMCs, just to make our life a little easier because we have to talk about these cells so much. So we, we gave them a little name. Um, yeah, so this is just a schematic, but this is a, a real section of one of these mice that we transplanted. This is a control, just bone marrow transplanted uh, uh, animal. And you see, yeah, there, there are, you see a couple green dots like here and there, but this is the situation you know, when we combine bone marrow trans transmutation with this, with this small molecule, with this trick, like the entire brain is full of these cells. And I cannot tell you how, um, you know, how thrilled we were when, when we first got these results. Because now, clearly, we have access to the entire brain, which in, in a simple cell therapeutic approach where we actually don't even touch the brain, we inject the cells into, into the bloodstream. So this, this was really, really mind boggling and, and super exciting. And we thought, well, now, you know, this, this idea that we had, you know, years before that I just, just showed to you, now we can actually replace the bad microglia, right? In, in, at least in some, in some cases of Alzheimer's patients and, and, and try to fix the problem. So that's what we now, of course, wanted to test. Is, is this idea working, right? At least in, in the mouse model. Um, we, before we could do this, we, of course, had a couple questions first. So these CDMCs, as we call them, they are not, um, they're like, they're from a different source, right? They're, 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 they're not exactly microglia. Do, do they still work in the regular Alzheimer model brain, right, as, as microglia do? Um, and, and can we actually replace the mutant microglia as well? All I've shown you so far, right, is just normal cells, right? But does this also work when, when, when the cells have these, these bad mutations, right? And can we, can we rescue a, 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 a phenotype? So um, uh, just, I, I'm afraid I, I, I show you, you know, similar figures from now on that are um, really meant for a scientific audience. So maybe just bear with me and I'll, I'll try to just give you the punchlines, but I still thought I want to show you the, like how the real data look like. So to, 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 to convince you that I'm not faking anything because the, 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 the findings were so remarkable. So first we, we you know, in, in, in a few con controls, but essentially the first experiment was just to do this trick, this, this replacement in a normal um, um, Alzheimer's model mouse that, that we call 5XFED. And um, this is the, the, the pro protocol, how, how we do this, this transportation. And sure enough, also in this mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, we can replace the microglia really, really well. 
But but the microglia in this case were, were normal, right? They had not not this this parameter mutation. We just want to make sure, make sure that these this cell transportation works also in this in this Alzheimer model. So and the, and these cells also engage with these plaques. So um, uh, here here you see just one of these plaques, but if the, the brain is actually full of these plaques in white. And you see that the microglia stained in red, again, with this marker, I have a bond that I showed you earlier, they clearly react to these plaques. So they, they, they do some, they try to get rid of these plaques, right? They, they are activated. And our CDMCs, you know, these, these yellow transplant cells, they do the same thing. They, they look a little different. If you, if you look carefully, they, they are not, they're a little more clumsy looking, but they, uh, they, they essentially do the same thing. So that was really reassuring. So the system is, is not only working in normal mice, it also works in the disease context. And then of course, um, we uh, wanted to see whether we can now fix this bad TREM2 problem, you know, that, that happens in, in, in many uh, Alzheimer patients. So what is TREM2 doing really in this mouse model? We know what it's doing in people, it causes Alzheimer disease, but what does it do in, in this mouse model? And turns out um, that in this case, um, the human, and the mouse experiments are nicely aligned because the loss of TREM2 makes things worse in this, in this model. So again, I show you um, now in whatever, blue, turquoise, whatever color, the same stain to stain for these plaques in, the, in, this, in, in this mouse model. And um, as you can see in a normal plaque model, right? When the, when the microglia are normal, they have a normal copy of TREM2. These, these microglia react strongly. They cluster around these plaques and try to deal with this and try to get rid of them. However, when you take away TREM2, either one copy or both copies, this is a TREM2 knockout as we call it, these microglia don't seem to sense the problem anymore. And the, these plaques also look differently. They're a little bit more diffuse. They're much more compact because the microglia do something with these plaques. But here it is as if these microglia are blind and, and can't smell and can't hear anything. They, they're just they're around as if there would be no problem in the brain. They look like normal microglia. Not, not, they're not reacting to these, to these plaques. So this TREM2 receptor uh, in this case seems to be uh, just like uh, people thought like a disease sensing mechanism, right? So without this receptor, the cells, they just don't know that there is a problem in the brain. Um, yeah, so we thought this is something we would like to fix. This, by the way, this the inactivity, so to say, of this microglia has a, a huge problem because um, the, the microglia are not, it cannot get rid of all of the plugs. So the, you, you have plugs in this model, but when you have no TREM2, uh, which, which is shown here, this is, uh, you know, this black stuff now are the plugs. In a normal, and you see the more TREM2 is lost, the more of these plaques you actually have. And this is quantified here, right? So it's uh, there's a much higher percentage of this of this A beta plaques in these brains without or uh, with, with micro without um, uh, TREM2. So, um, and maybe for the sake of time, I, I skip this, but there's also specific gene patterns that are changing in, in, in these cells. So the idea was, uh, you know, can we fix this problem with, with our approach that seemed to work so beautifully, even in a disease context? And unlike in clinical trials, in mice, we have very, very good ways to control for specific perturbations and, and therapeutic interference, right? So, in, of course, we have a mouse that, where we have a normal TREM2 and an absent TREM2 as a perfect control. And otherwise, this mouse is exactly identical. You never have that situation in a patient, right? Every person is different, luckily, right? Uh, you can only take patients and uh, like a control group. Um, but in mice, we, we, we are exactly sure. The only difference is the, the presence and the absence of this one gene, right? So, so it's very, uh, very well controlled. Um, and so the idea is we do this, this transplantation um, therapy in, in these mice and um, use TREM2 wild type bone marrow, right? Bone marrow stem cells to transplant into a TREM2 knockout animal uh, that, that also has this Alzheimer model. And as a, again, as a perfect control, we can do the exact same procedure with bone marrow cells from TREM2 knockout animals, right? Um, so that should, that is what we call a negative control. This should not be able to rescue this Alzheimer plaques, 
because um, we transplant everything exactly the same as in our therapeutic arm here. But we also transplant the cells, but now we transplant sick cells, so to say, right? Cells that have no TRAM2. So that should not be able to rescue. But otherwise, all the procedures, all the surgeries, the transplantations, all the treatments are exactly the same. The only difference is that the transplanted cells have the therapeutic gene or not, right? Again, this is something you could never do in a, in, in, in a clinical trial, unfortunately. But that's why, you know, these animal models are so powerful because we can very uh, clearly establish the, the disease mechanisms and what is actually the therapeutic agent that, that we use. Okay, so again, I want to depart from just schematics and show you how things actually look like in, in, in this real brains. And I, I've shown you something similar already. So this is a normal Alzheimer model, right? Uh, you see the, uh, the plugs now in blue and in black, the microglia. And there, um, this is just two different examples of two different regions of the brain. Um, you see how beautiful in the normal uh, situation the microglia react. And again, as I told you, without the TRAM2 molecule, the microglia do not react, right? They're just, they look like in a normal brain. They, they, don't, they don't see that the plugs are there. They don't do anything. And this is the result of our two transplantation cohorts. So here in, in this row, you see our therapeutic and here you see our control group. So here we transplanted the cells with a TREM2, an intact TREM2 molecule. And you see how beautiful these cells now cluster around these plugs and they seem to engage with them. Very different than the, the mutant microglia. And here's the control group where we transplanted the same cells, except they have no TREM2 molecule. And again, they don't seem to be able to, to see these plugs. They don't react to them, right? And that has consequences. Um, these, the, the number of plugs uh, is, uh, is, is greatly um, uh, increased uh, um, in, the, uh, in, in, in these disease models and quite nicely reduced in our therapeutic um, um, arm, right? And also, the, as, I, as I mentioned, the, uh, the plaques also, also change, and not only in numbers, but also in their morphology. So here's an example. So this is uh, uh, how these plaques look like typically when normal microglia are around. And this is how these plaques look like when the microglia are deficient and cannot and do not engage with them. They're much more diffuse, right? They're not so compact. They're, they're, they're more fibrils, it seems like, that are spreading into, in, into the brain. So we wondered, is that also rescued in, in, our, in our therapy? And again, those are our two uh, conditions here, the negative control and our therapeutic control. And you see how beautifully these uh, transplanted cells can rescue also this, this phenotype. And they, they, they really engage in these plaques in, in, a, in a functional manner, right? Um, another important function of these, uh, of these cells, these microglia, is that they're able to, to chew up things. We call this phagocytosis or eating material. So, so in a way, these, these cells are also there a little bit, you could, you could, you could, could call them like a, like a, whatever, a trash agency or something, right? So, so whatever neurons um, uh, want to get rid of and spit out into the environment around these cells, yeah, somebody needs to clean up right? and, and carry away the, you know, the trash. And that's what these microglia are doing in the brain as well. So they, they literally eat cell debris and, and stuff that you know neurons cannot um, um, deal with and including in part these these a beta plugs as well and it's, that's why we think there is fewer of these plugs when the microglia are functional and that's also why we think they're a little more compact but all these little fibrils that are sticking out from this from this core of these plugs are probably eaten away from the from the normal microglia so that's why we've also measured whether they actually can uh, now you know, eat up more of this of this A-beta material. And um, again, this is the, the normal situation of the, of the you know, non-transplanted uh, situation where we just measure the essentially overlay in, in this um, rendering here, in this sort of red rendering, we see the, 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 the volume in this, in this uh, particular um, area that we measured in the, in the mouse brain where the microglia are. 
and the green color shows you where the, the actual uh, phagocytosis is actually eating process happens. And then we just measure the overlap with this green and red signal with the, with the white signal here, which, is, which are the A-beta plugs. Right? And um, yeah, uh, when, when, you, when you do this and, and quantify this, it takes, takes a computer to, to help us, of course, uh, um, analyze all these images, then you can actually uh, see that this this area here is clearly tram2 dependent right and uh, i guess here is a little bit uh, clearer this is this is the cd68 overlap so without the tram2 receptor they can't really they don't really do much right they don't really focus those anything but we have a clear increase unfortunately not quite as high as the um as the notches micro in this particular case uh, but clearly significantly increased in our uh, th therapeutic group and nothing really happens in our you know, negative con control group as well. So uh, also this third um, component was, was nicely rescued with our cell therapeutic uh, approach. And last but not least, we also wanted to look at the uh, gene signatures of these cells. I briefly mentioned that there's a, a couple of genes, like a, a real pattern, a signature that is associated with this TRAM2 receptor um, and that um, needs to be restored for the microglia to be, uh, to be functional, right? So we um, did this whole procedure again, transplanted again a lot of mice um, and then isolated these uh, transplanted cells or control uh, microglia, non-transplanted cells, again, illustrated in the, like the red and the green color here. And then did a technology that's called RNA sequencing which is essentially a method to measure the expression of all genes in, in, in these cells. And it's about 20,000 of these genes. So it's, it's a really remarkable method to and it give, give, gives, gives us a, a really global, unbiased view of, of how, you know, what these cells are really doing and what, what their status is. So we, we thought this, this would be good to do. Um, so this is now a bunch of comparisons uh, here on, on the right, you see the genes that are going up. They are upregulated, and those are downregulated, um, dependent on uh, uh, dependent on the presence or absence of this TRAM2 receptor. Yeah. Um, so this is essentially our our signature that we that we want to restore in our in our transplanted uh, groups, and and that is a, by the way a very interesting signature because this really speaks to. What, what these microglia are actually doing to try to prevent things in the brain, right? So uh, when you, when you um, look at these pathways, you know, the, the, all these genes, we try to assemble them in pathways to, to give some meaning to them. And uh, there's, for example, you know, um, uh, lipid storage. Lipids are a very important component, chemical component of the brain. And, and um, uh, somebody needs to be there to provide enough lipids, you know, for the neurons and for the for the other cells to function properly. All the membranes are are, are full of lipids, and membrane biology is like a key role. And the, and the microglia seem to be a very important player in in providing, you know, like nurturing lipids to to the, to the environment. This is just one example of what you know this this trm two signature is, is is trying to do in 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 its in its attempt to sort of you know, fend off the disease, but also try to, you know, make things better for the, for the, for the neurons to survive better. And um, again, this is, this is a busy slide, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very um, impressive finding that when we just look at this signature and uh, that is actually called DAM, people love uh, acronyms. I'm sorry about that. DAM stands for disease associated microglia which is essentially the signature that I just, just told you. So um, in, in our case, from the data I just showed you, when we just compare uh, TREM2 wild type, or the normal TREM2 AD model, and TREM2 wild type, but no AD model, right? So it's just a normal mouse and an Alzheimer mouse with intact microglia. This is uh, the number of genes that are um, dysregulated, right, of this signature. Right, so it's it's uh, fifty three genes uh, uh, um, specifically that are going up or down um, in response to these plaques, essentially in 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 the microglia. And uh, very reassuringly, again, not all of them, unfortunately, but around thirty of them were also beautifully restored 
in our therapeutic group. So this is now the comparison between the our, our you know term to white up cells transplanted term to knockout recipients compared to a term to knockout Alzheimer model. I hope this was clear. <laughs> Sorry if it's too confusing, but uh, um, again, just just um, you know trust me. Essentially, it's the comparison between our therapeutic group and our uh, you know the, 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 the like the the, the Alzheimer model with with the bad microglia, right? And we see that that the majority of the genes that are should be induced are actually induced in this in this situation. So that was that was really cool. And then we looked a little bit uh, more specifically into like one branch of this of this signature um, that is um, you know from from what we what is currently known about this receptor here, you know, in this, in this blue color here, you see the term two receptor and there's a couple other molecules that associate with it and are important for, for, this, for, for the outside signal to be transduced inside the cell. There's kinases and blah, 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 blah. You, don't, you don't need to know the details, but we, we want to make sure that we're looking at the, at the right thing and specifically looked at you know, the, the genes that are involved in this particular pathway. And uh, sure enough, Hmm, where is it? Here, here we go. We can um, also restore this pathway very, very nicely in uh, in the transmutation. This is no transmutation again. So this is a normal, um, just a normal mouse. This is uh, an Alzheimer mouse, and you see that uh, much of this signature is becoming like many of these boxes are turning more red as opposed to blue. So I should I should point out that each row here is is a different gene. Um, I don't know how many genes we have here from top to bottom, maybe some 30 or so. Um, maybe one of you might be faster to count it <laughs> than I am. Um, and the color of uh, blue means low expression and the color red means high expression. So you see that things are going up um, or sometimes go going down right, in, 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 in this pathway. So this is the response in microglia to the EPA plux. And this is the situation in normal microglia that have no TREM2 receptor. And you see, it's still, you know, some some still go up, but much, much, much reduced, right? Particularly when you look at this cluster of genes here, you know, there's there's very much red here, uh, and 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 not so much in in, in this trem two. So that that pathway, as we say, is trem two dependent, right? With, without the in the absence of trem two, this, these genes cannot be induced very well. And here are the results from our uh, treatment groups. So here in, in, in this column here is our therapeutic and here's our control group. And this it's quite actually quite uh, obvious, I, I think, for, for, for everybody to see that you see much, much more red color here in these, uh, in these genes than, uh, than in here in the control group. So again, also this very specific, um, a narrower TREM2 um, pathway is, is beautifully restored in this, uh, in this therapeutic uh, angle. Yeah, so that brings me to my summary slide. I hope um, uh, you, you could follow me through, through all the, uh, all the uh, results that we're so excited about. But in essence, we found an amazingly efficient way to literally replace essentially all microglia in the brain with transplanted cells. Um, so now, you know, we think the sky is the limit of like potential possibilities that, that we can do in particular, because the cells that we transplant, we have them at our fingertips before transplantation, right? We have them ex vivo, as, as we say, we have them in a culture dish. We can, we can do anything we want with these cells. We can, we can change genes. We can, we can take out genes. We can add genes. We can, you know, now with CRISPR, we can even, change a single base pair in, in these cells. There's so much we can do with these cells. And then we can, in a second step, after a genetic modification, have them incorporated into the entire brain where they then can you know, try to be better at defending you know, diseases, uh, sort of defending the brain from diseases, or, or maybe re even restore um, and regenerate, try to help regenerate uh, the brain. And uh, in particular, what, what uh, you know, we, we have shown, uh, thanks to, to your funding, um, we showed that this really critical uh, gene, TREM2, which is mutant in, in, in uh, uh, many Alzheimer's uh, patients, um, we can actually restore that TREM2 function in an adult mouse 
using this 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 uh, transplantation therapy, and then we, we we could show that um, a simple you know one time blood injection fixes the you know the term two problem uh, for the rest of the life of these of these animals, and and these cells are almost just as functional as the endogenous microglia would be if they would not have this bad gene, right? Um, yeah, so I'm very, very grateful for um, my very happy and very hardworking lab. Um, this gentleman uh, that is, is, is smiling so nicely here is called uh, Yong Jin Yo, and he was um, the main driver of, of most of these experiments uh, that I showed you. He uh, was, uh, or he, he got um, some help from uh, the gentleman sitting next to him, Takeshi uh, Uenaka and uh, Marius Meda. Um, another fellow uh, in the lab. And um, yeah, in addition to your funding, which I again am very uh, grateful for, that really, really was the seed um, that actually allowed us to, um, to um, ask for more money because we, you know, we had really exciting preliminary data so we could go out, hey, uh, things are working. Um, we, can, we can do more things. So the, um, the Kleberg Foundation uh, was very generous in, in, in supporting us, as well as um, a, a grant from, from, the, from the New York Stem Cell Foundation. So with that, I would like to thank you for, for your attention and um, would be very happy